Welcome back to Pivot Point. I am your host, Maya Rocky Moore, and we are today talking about the Trayvon Martin verdict, uh, the unfortunate verdict uh, in which uh, George Zimmerman, a volunteer night watchman in a gated community in Florida, uh, follows a young man who he presumes to be guilty of some crime. Uh, there's a tussle, and George Zimmerman shoots this young man. He is a teenager, a 17-year-old young African-American male, and the young African-American male is dead, and George Zimmerman is not found to be guilty of any crime. We are joined on the phone with Tobias Packer and Joseph Phelan. They are organizers who are behind the we are not trayvon martin dot com effort if you are not trayvon martin tobias who are you <laughs> uh hi maya thanks for having us on um i am just an individual um i'm a white guy who grew up in the suburbs of south florida who lives in metro miami and um who was just really upset um and dismayed about the verdict, and I wanted to do something. Um, the night that the verdict came down, I had woken up <clears throat> from a nap in the middle of the night and saw what happened, and, and I actually just got in my car and drove around to see where people were gathering to try and just be with folks, talk about what had happened. Um, and didn't really find anybody. I went to a vigil the next day and just really felt like we needed to have more conversation um, especially for uh, white people um, and how um, white privilege and folks who in inherit racial privilege, um, not only can how they can fight racism, but like how racial privilege benefits us and um, led to the death of Trayvon. Joseph, who are you? Um, hey, Maya, thanks for having us on. Like the I said, my name is Joseph Salen. Um, I grew up in the suburbs of New York City. Um, I'm a white guy. Um, come from a working class background. My dad's an immigrant from Ireland. My mom's an Italian American from Queens. And, uh, you know, I was up, I heard about the, the, the verdict in the case and couldn't really figure out what to do about it. And the next day I went to a protest and I stayed up late that night after the protest. And there'd been lots of chanting that said, I am Trayvon Martin. And I understand the point of that chant, which is a, to have people understand and relate to Trayvon Martin and relate to the idea that this was an unjust killing and to be in solidarity. But I looked at myself and I understood that I would never be Trayvon Martin. Um, and in fact, it was really important for me to name that and say, even though I will never be Trayvon Martin, and even though I can't assume and won't assume what it was like to live his life, I'm still standing up against racism in this country, understanding that racism shaped what happened that night and shaped the verdict that came out of it. Tobias, you just said that your white privilege is inherited. What is it about your consciousness that enables you to actually see uh, that having white skin uh, is a privilege in America? Um, you know, I can't, I can't name the exact moment when I started to see these things, um, but I think part of it comes from the fact um, and like, you know, living in South Florida, living in Metro Miami, uh, the majority of people who live here aren't white. Um, and so, you know, many of my friends, um, and closest people to me in my life are, are folks who, folks of color, right? And so hearing how, what their lived experiences are and understanding them in relationship to my own, um, I'm, I'm able to see some of that. And for me, it's not just seeing it, but it's being able to stand up. Um, and, and taking taking steps to uh, against it. Yeah. So it sounds like the social circles that you move in, uh, you are actually a minority uh, in, <laughs> in in the sense of it makes you conscious of of your skin color, but also of the lived experiences of people who are not white. And has that been revolutionary for you? Um, you know, it's it's part of my life. It's just part of my narrative. I don't. No, no, you know, there have obviously been moments of great, uh, great profound moments that have, have really um, shook um, the way that I see the world. But in terms of uh, revolutionary, you know, I'm just another, just another kid. <laughs> Joseph. I'm not sure how revolutionary my life is. Yeah. Uh, Joseph, tell us about the purpose of WeAreNotTrayvonMartin.com. 
The purpose. I mean, so the purpose when I initially started at 2 a.m. on Monday morning last week, uh, so we're coming up on the seven day anniversary, the seven day anniversary of it, is uh, that I I was frustrated, um, and I wanted to call this question of race, particularly from my perspective of racial justice and racial privilege, um, understanding that it's a really complicated question in this country, but also understanding that a lot of white people don't actually ever talk about race or think about race, and that's part of the privilege of it, of being white. Um, and so I started it at 2 a.m., and I sent an email out to about 20 friends saying, hey, look at this thing I started. And until about 1 o'clock the next day, nothing happened with it. And around 1, 1 1.30, it started to just blow up, and it, it got out of control, and that's when I emailed Tobias, and I said, hey, Tobias, you need a hand here. Um, and the point of it and what it's become really, right? So the point of it initially was to say, I am not Trayvon Martin and I'm still fighting against racism. And that was the point of it from the beginning. And that remains to be the point of it today for people who don't, who, who are not the young African American men and don't have that experience in the society to name it and name their role and their understanding of their place as race has placed them in the society. And then also say that regardless of all of that, we are going to unite and fight against racism um, and say that. So, so it's very important for, especially for talking to white people and mind you, not everyone who's contributed to this block has been white, but when talking to white people is to call the question of race and say, Hey, you know, you're white. And that actually means something. It means this thing, this thing, and this, it means you're less likely to go to jail. It means you're more likely to have a higher income. It means you're more likely to go to college. It means you have all these, you're less likely to be stopped by the police. And when you're stopped by the police, you're less likely to be arrested. Um, and it's often hard for people to see, white people in particular, to see that privilege because it's just our worldview. It's normal. Um, and um, unless you live in a situation like the bias described where you actually are engaging with people from different um, racial backgrounds and ethnic backgrounds, you may never have a question about that. Um, and I'm tired of seeing people who look like me be on the wrong side of this fight. And so the real intention behind starting this Tumblr was to start push, pushing the question, calling the question on race for, pe- for white people, and say, listen, we're on a moving train, and you can choose to get off this train and oppose racism, or you can choose to stay on this train and be quiet, but that train is not headed towards justice, and that's where I want to go. So I, I have to follow up and uh, ask you how you have been received by people that don't necessarily see this as a good thing, who are okay uh, ensconced in their uh, bubble of privilege and, and don't want to be called out on it. Um, so, yeah, do you want to answer that, Tobias? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start with Joe, and if you have anything else, you know, obviously, Go ahead. on the gap. Go ahead. I, I mean, for us, uh, reading through the, the submissions that we've gotten, you know, uh, the, the overwhelming majority of submissions um, posts from people, and it's, at this point it's, it's well over um, 2,000, um, <clears throat> have been positive or basically, um, you know, part of, in, in part joining in the spirit of why we started the blog. Um, and then every once in a while, um, someone will send a really unpleasant note, but I think those voices for me have been very much drowned out by the the, the overwhelming number of people who have stepped up and said, um, you know, this is my story, I am not Trayvon Martin, and I'm going to do something about, about it to make sure that uh, we get the end this system of racism that led to his death. You know, in the research world, we call that uh, a self-selection bias, uh, that people who already feel and think the same way that you do are just joining in uh, your cause. But what about the people who, who don't believe that? And there are many, many, pe- many people who actually don't believe in not only that, but don't even want to talk about this again. They're tired of the conversation. They think that it's outdated, that we left that all behind in the you know, 19th, 20th century. Yeah, well, you know, they're wrong. <laughs> so, you know, put simply, they're wrong. And the assumption that we live in a post-racial society, and this comes up all the time, we live in a post-racial society because we have a black president. Well, how many presidents did we have to have before Obama to get to a black president? And how many more are we going to have to have to get to a woman president or a gay president, right? Like, that just because we've hit a point where things are changing, right? Like we wouldn't have had a black president 50 years ago. That is an advance in our society. That doesn't mean that we've erased 500 years of racial oppression in the society. Um, you know, there's this, the, one of the lawyers, one of Zimmerman's lawyers was quoted as saying, 
um, you know, that people keep referring to the elephant in the room as race, but that wasn't true. And I agree with him. The elephant in the room wasn't race because race actually built the room that that trial took place in. Wow. And, and so I really think it's important for us as white people to put this blog up and have people engage in a conversation. And let's be real, the blog post, there's some really amazing and inspiring stuff on there. And then there's some really like messy and raw emotional stuff on there. And it's not all white people. There's plenty of African Americans who are posting. There's plenty of Asian Americans who are posting. There's conversations about not just white privilege, but light skin privilege among people of color. It's really deep. And it's very all over the place. Mm-hmm. And we're pushing this conversation out in this forum and understanding that we're going to hit a vein of people who are already outraged by this. But we really want to see, and the next steps for what we've started is really continuing to push this conversation out beyond a Tumblr on the Internet, but really engaging with organizations that are doing work on the ground and on the Internet and pushing for conversations on race to happen at a higher level of frequency and a higher level of depth and to happen in a way that will move us forward, right? So that takes a lot of compassion from everybody involved in the conversation. Because we don't talk about this often, people are often going to use the wrong language and say the wrong things, but mean something very different at the heart of it. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're really searching for, is an authentic communication towards building solidarity with each other across racial boundaries so that we can actually end racism in this country. Because it's not enough just to get justice for Trayvon's family. The only way that will happen to get justice for Trayvon is if we can actually eliminate the circumstances under which his death happened. Well, it's interesting because you talk about uh, race actually built the the room which the trial was held in, which suggests that race and racism are institutional in nature, which I would argue is absolutely, absolutely correct. So uh-huh. it, it's, it's more than a conversation, right? We're actually talking about systemic institutional reforms. Bias, yeah. Bias I, that I, needs to be yeah, actually I, I addressed. I think I think for me um, the importance of this moment, Maya, is the fact that for for folks like me who benefit from um, racial privilege, you know, like Joe said, we don't have to talk about it, and sometimes folks are scared to talk about it in right. terms of not knowing how to say the right thing, right? right. And so when we have a public conversation, uh, I I sincerely believe that we're beginning to equip people um, not just with the language to kind of have a communal conversation about this, right? But with the language to really think and see how these institutional pieces cut fit together to build that room, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And then um, ultimately for me, I want to push, you know, push beyond that conversation and actually help equip people with tools to dismantle them, right? Small interventions in everyday life, in addition to joining uh, with struggles and fights with organizations, you know, big organizations, or not organizations, but just people, right? Mm-hmm. That channel, you know, these individuals who have really joined this conversation into that work um, to, to move forward, move the conversation and then all the action for it as well. So what are the next steps? What do you uh, recommend that people who are listening to you today uh, do uh, in order to join this movement? We are not TrayvonMartin.com. Yeah, so the best, the best way to go, we've actually got a page with recommended actions to take um, up on the blog. So if you go to we are not TrayvonMartin.com, I believe it's slash take action, but there's a link right there on the page, so um, and this is in that. Um, in addition to kind of some of the organizations that we recommend um, checking out, it's got some of those everyday things that you can do to really challenge institutional and interpersonal racism in your life. Joseph, I've got to ask you this, because the president invoked his daughters and talked about how he watches his daughters interact with people of other races, and he says that the next generation is better than that. But I've got to wonder about how class mediates race, right? Because we do know that there is racial isolation out there, particularly in low-income communities of color, where they're not Mm -hmm. interacting because of segregation that happens in our communities, because of segregation in our school systems, uh, that Mm -hmm. they're not interacting on a regular basis uh, with people across Mm -hmm. racial and ethnic lines. And so is that true? Is the next generation more racially tolerant? Will it be uh, more progressive in this area? So I think that's a really good question, and I think, you know, it's going to come out in the wash, right? And so mm-hmm. while I 
the question around the, the segregation, and particularly economic segregation, you see this in cities like Miami, where Tobias lives, and I lived for seven years before coming back to New York, and you even see it in New York, um, and I grew up in the suburbs of New York, and you definitely see it there, with that type of racial segregation, it's far easier for people to stick to stereotypes um, and not challenge the assumptions and the things they're taught, um, both by the culture and the institution. But the generation that we are in now has the Internet. Um, and I know a lot of people point to the Internet as the savior of many things. But look at our Tumblr. The reality is people engaged with this question about whiteness and privilege, as well as racism um, and inter, inter, inter-race racism, um, from all different geographies of the United States, including around the world, on a, on a real-time level. And it sparked countless and countless conversations in the real world that may never have happened. Um, and there's power there in breaking in information sharing and breaking down things. Yet on the other, the other side of the internet is the anonymous posting and the ability to be completely outrageously messed up at all times. So I think this question is really important. And I also want to get to this because this is something that's come up a lot on the blog in terms of the, the engagement with class and race and economic levels is that, yes, there is white privilege out there, and I come from a working-class background. Just because I have white privilege doesn't mean that my, there's not black people who have more wealth than I do. But when I was born and I had white skin, I, my starting line for life was far more ahead of a kid who was born black. And if Obama and I walked through the same street at night, the likelihood is he would get he would get stopped by the police before I would. Mm-hmm. And then if we both got stopped, he would get arrested. And if we both got arrested, he would get more jail time. And so we've been challenged a lot on our blog to actually engage with this question about class, particularly from um, poor white folks um, and, and working class white people. And the reality is sometimes it's a, it's a question of safety and not actually access. And also sometimes it's a question of psychological privilege as well. Mm. Um, so, you know, the psychological what do you mean by wages that? of whiteness. Okay. I mean, I grew up, I grew up in public school in New York. Um, the majority of heroes and leaders and inspirations I was taught about were white men. Mm-hmm. That's psychological. I turned on the TV when I was growing up and you, the only time you saw black folks is when they were stereotypes and they were criminals and all of that. And so I'm told through all my cultural milieu that I'm right, that I am normal. And that, to understand what that means, I would actually have to flip and think about, like, what would it mean to walk out the door every day and have a culture around me that tells me I'm not normal? Not even that, is that when I walk out the door, I'm criminal. So psychologically, if you took a poor African-American and a poor white person, they have the same, mater- they have the same access to wealth or education or what have you, there still is a psychological thing that happens that that we can't discount as a part of the privilege. And that do you think about. that that is why it's been so discombobulating for Tea Party Republicans to see a black man in the White House? Oh, I mean, I think, well, the, you know, I think if we're talking about Tea Party and we're talking about that, I mean, when we're talking about the Tea Party, we're not talking about like moderate white folks who are, who are engaging in and believe in democracy um, and a multiracial democracy. When we start talking about the Tea Party and all the way on that side, you're talking about people who are actually there. There's there's crossover between Tea Party and organized racists, <laughs> and like literally organized racists. Okay. And that doesn't mean that everyone in the Tea Party is that, but there's definitely influence in that way. Mm-hmm. And so there, these are folks. These are folks who are like very actually committed to um, the idea of the United States as white America. Um, and so I think that's, that's definitely something that's there. And then that, that pervades then the media as well, right? right so right. You look at, you look at Bill O'Reilly, he, he, there's plenty, we can, you know, you can pull up plenty of quotes where he just speaks very openly racist language yeah. about yeah. African Americans. And this, so we want to engage, not just the people who look at our blog, we also do want to engage with those people and have a conversation with them and challenge their assumptions. And, you know, part of that, you asked what we're going to do next, part of that is getting off of the Internet, getting into the media, getting into the media that those people listen to, and having hard conversations. Um, because those people are in my family. Got it. Um, and I, if I'm committing myself to fighting racism, i got to start where I am. And that's with my white family, and that's with everyone. 
Tobias um, Packer and Joseph yeah. Phelan, thank you so much for this refreshing conversation. I think you're on to something. You are not Trayvon Martin, uh, but we you are, are the creator <laughs> of We Are Not Trayvon Martin dot com. I encourage Thank all of you. my listening audience to actually visit that website. We are not TrayvonMartin.com. And thank you for your leadership on this issue. Maya, thank thanks so much for having me. All right. You are listening to Maya Rockymore, host of Pivot Point, sponsored by the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare. Stay with us after the break as we listen to hip-hop artist Jasiri X. 